Well, Shoreline Church has partnerships with ministries like Compassion International, where we do work in Guatemala and El Salvador, with World Mission, where we kind of partner with them all over the world through prayer, through the treasure, through teams going and be going along with them on different things. And so um, one of the things is with our partnership is then through this partnership, Sherry and I have also become partners. Sherry actually goes two or three times out of the four uh, board meetings every year and serves in that way. And once a year, uh, Greg and Kathy come here, or sometimes just Greg, but Greg and Kathy, and uh, we spend about a day to day and a half, and I just grill him and drill him and push him and give him a hard time and challenge him. And, uh, but we talk about vision and long-term plans and where the ministry is going. And I actually remember, and I was, we were talking about this before, about four or five years ago, Greg was telling me, he said, yeah, you know, last year we brought out this many treasures uh, to the world, and then the next, this year we, you know, we increased by like 11%, and this year we, then we increased by 12 or 13%. And he said, I'm looking at this next year, and I said, well, what if you increased by about 200 to 300%? And he said, what? And I said, what if you didn't just in incrementally, like multiplied, because it's so important and it's urgent. And he said, well, that would mean we have to change our structure and our staff and everything. Remember that? And I said, yes, it would. And what have you done the last few years? Changed everything, right? And, and you're giving out now close to three times as many treasures, right? Exactly. And so God is multiplying, and you are part of that. We are part of that. And so I want to pray for Greg and Kathy. He'll tell you a little bit about his family. Uh, but I want to pray for God's blessing because they are in this as a team for about 20 years. They've been serving the world by bringing God's word. And I will tell you, that brings um, spiritual attack and all kinds of things against them and their family. They need your prayer. So will you pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, thank you for Greg and Kathy. Thank you that they stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that they are covered by the protective blood of Jesus Christ through his life and death and sacrifice and resurrection. But we pray over them for your protection, for your power, uh, for Kathy and their five kids, uh, for Greg as he's here in the States ministering, but as he travels all over the world. Will you protect them? Will you fill them? Will you give them new passion for the future and multiply your word going out into the world in deep, dark places that need to know about Jesus? Now open our hearts and prepare us to receive and anoint Greg to bring your message about the power of your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you welcome them? Amen, amen. Oh, thanks, brother. Thank you, love you, buddy. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, Shoreline. Good morning. All right, how are you guys doing today? Outstanding. Well, I, your, your reputation precedes you and uh, so appreciate, Shoreline, the example you are, obviously here in uh, the peninsula, but around the world. And thank you so much. Thank you specifically for allowing your pastor, uh, Kevin and Sherry, I might add, uh, they do pour into us, and, and it is such a blessing. Just I look forward to this time every year where Kevin can encourage me and challenge me and uh, stretch me. We all need people like that in our lives, don't we? I don't, I don't know. Uh, being a follower of Jesus certainly wasn't a, uh, a call to isolation. We need each other. The body needs one another. Um, and I certainly can't do this. This is our 20th year serving at World Mission, Kathy and I. Um, we uh, just are, are, are living uh, in the center of God's sweet spot for our life, we believe. But we, uh, we've been married 27 years, and we were high school sweethearts. Anybody else? High school sweethearts. Let's see. Come on. Woo! Okay, I can see them. I see a few. I see a few. <laughs> Kathy and I were high school sweethearts, okay? But our, actually our journey be, long before that, we were in the same nursery school class together. <laughs> no. Hey, I know what some of you are thinking. I waited till fourth grade, okay? Don't get the wrong idea. I was very patient, very patient. But the Lord has blessed us with five children. Uh, two of them, uh, Anna was married in April. Uh, Luke got married in June. So this has been a very interesting year for us, but super, super exciting um, about what God is doing. And, uh, you know, just to be a part of seeing the gospel go around the world. And that's my privilege this morning to preach about how the word of God is changing lives. And uh, we're going to talk about this this morning. But the word of God is important. I mean, if this is the, the book, the single book that guides your life and my life and what we um, strive to follow. It's important. We know about it, isn't it? I mean, this thing was written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors in three continents without contradiction. I mean, just think about that. Archaeologists, whether you're from a Christian perspective um, or a secular perspective, a Jewish perspective, all agree. Archaeological evidence is overwhelming about the truth and the, the lack of contradiction. There's no contradiction in this book. And then 
Archaeologists did us a great favor, some about 70 years ago, when they, the great discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found about 800 manuscripts that did what? That further proved the validity and the accuracy and the inerrancy of the precious word of God. And it didn't start like this, did it? I mean, this isn't the, the, the first edition of the Bible. The first edition of the Bible was when Moses goes up, right? And he gets the, the Ten Commandments on a rock. Then he comes down and, you know, in his frustration, he, he drops it. And then God says, hey, yeah, I'm going to do the first um, copy machine. Because God said, hey, I got this one. And then he goes back and he does the Ten Commandments with his own finger and replicates it. So it starts on a stone. And then through the, the, uh, the, the, the scribes and uh, the, the amazing um, sort of process that they would follow, every single letter and how they would transfer the, the stories in the, the Bible, the books of the Bible to animal skins and then to paper. And then Johann Gutenberg comes up with the printing press, right? And we've got mass production of it. And so the Bibles are going around and then comes technology. Do you know the importance of the technology today? Because historically, Bible societies and organizations that we work with, we were on a trajectory, and it looks something like this. There's 7,000 languages in the world. And so what we would do, and rightly so, we would identify a language where there's not a translation. I mean, it only makes sense to prioritize that, doesn't it? So you'd go in and you'd translate that language. And then you'd print that language. You'd distribute that language, and you'd check it off the list. You'd go back, you'd translate a language. You'd print that language. You'd distribute that language and you'd check it off the list. The only problem with that is that two-thirds of the world are oral learners. They prefer to learn in a non-literate way, and so if you just simply have at your disposal the Word of God in a printed form, it's not going here. Because I prefer to learn in a non-literate way. And so that's why the treasure is so critical. God's word, yes, this is a Bible, this is a Bible, this is a Bible. We distribute it on micro SD cards. We have, we have digital Bibles that transmit it to people's phones. Technology is vital to reaching the nations that Jesus had died for. And so for us, when we're getting resources from partners like, like you, we want to we be good stewards of that. We want to send it to places and honor the Lord with that. And God has called us as an organization very specifically to oral learners in unreached people groups. And you might ask yourself, well, seriously, Greg? In September of 2018, there's, there's well, uh, uh, unreached people groups? As a matter of fact, out of the seven billion people in the world today, two billion are without a gospel witness. Oh, they're hard places. That's not the low-hanging fruit of missions. But Jesus died for them, didn't he? And we need to mobilize as the body of Christ and prioritize these very places. Every time your heart beats today, someone will go into eternity who has not had a single gospel witness. It's not that they're driving by a church, hearing it on radio, a Christian approaching them. There's not one single gospel witness. That's where the treasure goes. And you guys are making that happen. There's a couple photos I'm going to show you because when you prioritize and you feel the stewardship issue of where are we going to send this, you ask yourself, God, was there need the greatest? And I would argue with you that we could make a case Jesus had a special place in his heart for the least of these, didn't he? I mean, Jesus was always drawn, drawn to the down and out, the weak and the vulnerable. My claim today would be that the least of these in our generation, which by the way, we're stewards of. In our lifetime, we're stewards of this earth. We're stewards of the final words of Jesus, aren't we? And I would make a charge or a claim that the greatest representation of the least of these, the weak and the vulnerable, are those that are displaced, like this beautiful, precious girl in a refugee cramp. They wouldn't allow us to see her face because they said if she's somehow exposed, it'll be just an unbelievably heavy price that she would pay. Forced to marry at a young age, but amazed and drawn by the compassion of Jesus. Particularly, we asked her, we said, well, what is it about the compassion? She said, when Jesus healed the blind guy. Oh, that did something to me. That Jesus would identify with someone. Well, why do you think that is? Because she puts herself in that place. 
Do you know that today there's 68 million displaced people in the world today? On our watch, war, violence, persecution. And every two seconds, a new person is added. What's interestingly about the displaced people of the world is there's something in common they have. Because if you were to look at the world and the countries and say, where are they coming from? The list would look something like this. Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, Myanmar, Iraq, Nigeria. Ah, places where the name of Jesus has not been shared. And yet, because of their displaced situation, they're sent where? Like she is in a refugee camp where now all of a sudden, the body of Christ has access to them and we didn't before. An unprecedented opportunity in the body of Christ today on our watch to go to these refugees that previously were not accessible, but now we can go into these refugee camps. The next photo is a man from Iraq. Oh, love the word of God, loves the word of God. His testimony is, yeah, I'd rather stay here in this refugee camp than go back to Iraq where I'll be targeted by militant Sunnis that will try and kill me. I would rather stay in this tent in this refugee camp than go back. And oh my goodness, was he blessed by the word of God. And by the way, the treasures that are distributed to that beautiful uh, lady and then this man as well, are all distributed through the body of Christ. All of them. I mean, it's hard to make a disciple without the word of God and the body of Christ, isn't it? And so the body, local Christians are reaching in and they're loving this guy and they're telling him about the Lord and raising him up. And then the final photo, a young girl. As we're reaching out to the, the kids from Muslim background families, I might add, the parents are like, I want nothing to do with them, associating it with the Western religion but they'll send their children because they love them, care for them, feed them, teach them English, give them treasures. And what happens when she turns the treasure on and she's listening to it? It's going into her heart. And these stories that she's memorizing, where do they go once they go into her heart? They go home to mom and dad, don't they? <laughs> and all of a sudden you start mobilizing a whole young generation of missionaries taking the gospel into these unreached places. The other three things that those photos had in common and they were, is that they were all from Lebanon, every single one of them. Why Lebanon? Because it's the only country in the Middle East where it's not illegal to convert from Islam to Christianity. Guys, the word of God is changing lives today. It's changing the world. In these ways, it's changing the world. The word of God, it equips us. You and I, when we come in contact with the word of God, it equips us. This is what the Bible says in 2 Timothy. And from infancy, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Wow. Every word inspired by God. Not of human origin, is it? The words, it's eternal truth. Through it, we have understanding of the riches and depths of the knowledge of God. That assurance and confidence equips us, doesn't it? And it changes our behavior. I have the privilege when I travel around to meet some inspirational stories of people, precious, precious people, children, men, women who have been transformed by the power of the gospel. Abba, Young man in West Africa. You may have heard of Boko Haram. It's one of the active uh, terrorist group that's out there. Now, Boko Haram is a Hausa language, some 30 million speakers, 99% Muslim. And Boko Haram literally means Western education is evil. That's what you stand for. And so as a result, anything that's accepting of Western education becomes a target. And so as you can imagine, so many Christians are, and even moderate Muslims, but you heard of the, the kidnappings of those 200 plus young women from Northern Nigeria, Boko Haram, the hands of Boko Haram. Well, they also are targeting individuals. And one man, a very influential individual, came to know the Lord. God, God saved this guy in a miraculous way. And he started sharing the gospel. He started 
leading other Muslims to Jesus and became a threat. And so Boko Haram mobilized a group of people and they went to his home and they executed this man with his son right next to him. They took the young boy whose name's Abba, they took him to the local Muslim imam and the imam said, your dad was a fool. He's not a Christian. He's a Muslim and so are you. 12 year old boy. Beat him, tormented him, used him as a slave for two weeks. The first moment Abba had when he was out of their sight, they, took, they sent him to fetch some water. As soon as he got out of their sight for the first time in two weeks, he ran as fast as he could to who he knew was a, a local Christian pastor in the area. Shows up at the pastor's office and said, Pastor, they killed my father, they killed my father. They've been, they've been tormenting me and, and they're, they're, you know, they're forcing me. They're saying you know, all these horrible things and they'll do to me. And, we were able to get in contact with him through our partners and we got him to safety. But as our partners on the ground did that, they said, Abba, you know that had they caught you, they would have killed you. I said, I know. Abba, why'd you do that? Why'd you run for your life? They would have killed you. And this is what the 12-year-old boy said. He said, because the bullet that killed my father has made me more determined to follow Jesus. A 12-year-old boy. Now, was that just because his father was a great orator and a great debater and telling him, hey, here's why Christianity? Or was it because his father seeded the word of God inside of Abba's life and equipped his son? I love the statement, the quote that someone said, a man who has an argument is always at the mercy of of a man with an experience. And when that experience is the living, active word of God, that won't return boy that's inside of you, oh, the person with an argument doesn't have a chance. The word of God mobilizes us. The word of God mobilizes us. This is what Paul said in Romans. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Ilis Kerm, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And, and I believe Jesus modeled that well. You know, back in their day, the Jews and the Samaritans really didn't get along that well. And if you were in Judea and you had to go to Galilee, you, you couldn't get there without avoiding Samaria. Judea, Galilee, all in between, but the Jews would. They'd go around the east side of the Jordan River and they'd come back in. But there's an amazing story in the Gospels of the woman at the well. You're familiar with that, the Samaritan woman, where Jesus beelined it right through the place that <gasps> his disciples were like, oh, what are you doing talking to her? Oh, he had an assignment. And as the Gospel mobilizes you and I, it takes us to uncomfortable places, doesn't it? I mean, it's not fun going to that next door neighbor who's super hostile, is it? You've invited them to Shoreline, their family. Nah, don't want to be a part, don't want to be a part. How about when you're a student at a school and kids mock you? Not a lot of fun, is it? Not a lot of fun. And going particularly where the gospel's not been, hostile environment. But this morning, I want to encourage you that Christianity is the only religion where God demands a sacrifice and then provides it himself. Only religion. Your Savior knows. And your Savior wants to be with you as you do that. As we were in India one time, we, we came upon a group of village where the treasures had been distributed. And the Lord put it on our heart to throw the net. Share the gospel with these, these people. And, and we did. And, and there, was a, there was one man in particular who gave his life to the Lord. And I was so encouraged by that. And, and I asked you know, him to tell his story. And he said, well, these guys would gather in a listening group. And I said, well, what did that look like? And I said, hey, you guys get together and get in the listening groups that this guy's telling, you know, telling me you used to do. And they kind of organized. And they were very structured and organized. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, pretend I'm not here and then get in your listening group. And they kind of reshuffled and they looked like, that again. So clearly, that's how they do the listening groups. And I'm like, okay, now how long does this go on for? Where a guy holds it up like this in the Hindi language. Oh, for an hour? Like every day? Every day. We listen for an hour. And whoever can come, comes. 
and just listen to the word of God. So this man who got saved, he said, well, I would walk past this village every day in a little trail that went right next to where they would gather, and I would stop, and I would listen to that because it was in my own language. And he said, well, what happened? He said, well, every time I do that, this is a Hindu man, every time I would do that, it would bring peace to my heart. This guy has no Christianese, no vocabulary, no concept of, you know, what's the right thing to say? He's just saying, it brought peace to my heart. You, you recognize that's a supernatural occurrence, right? The word of God going into him. So we said, we got to give this guy a treasure. And so I, I put one in his hands, and before I did, I said, when I come back next year and talk to you, I'm going to ask you, how many people have you shared this with? He t- oh, he took that question seriously. Looked all around. And he said, when I see you next time, I will have shared this single treasure with 2,000 people. Do you see that story? A Hindu man at 11 a.m. gives his life to Jesus at noon, and by 1.30, he's saying, I'm going to go reach 2,000 people. Why? Because the gospel and the word of God mobilizes us. Not only that, the word of God is living, and it's active. It's living and active. But the word of God is alive and active, it says in Hebrews. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, I don't know about you, but that verse scares me. Like every thought, every action, God wants us to judge it against the word of God. I found some interesting research recently from Cornell. They did a study and they said, today, you will make 35,000 decisions. Whoa. Children only make 3,000. That that explains a lot, doesn't it? Why some people just never want to grow up. Isn't that, that, that's a lot. That's pretty insightful, isn't it? But today, you will make 226 decisions on food alone. So those arguments you're going to have as you're leaving church about where, that's all right, that's normal, it's normal, 226 decisions on food today. But just think about that for a moment. With our average life and the things going on, can you imagine a dead set of religious rules guiding your life? Wow. I was on an airplane a few years ago. And one of our main partners is in Israel. And I, I was flying from Israel and leaving. And, you know, picture those four, you know, seats across in the, in the middle aisle, the middle section. And I'm on the aisle. And right next to me is a young lady. And then this, this rabbi comes and, he, and he, he looked apart, man. He had, you know, he had it all going on. And he, he sat down next to the young lady. Well, shortly before we took off, there was another young lady who sat next to him on the other aisle. So he's between these two young ladies. And he started making such a commotion. And he's calling his stewardess and everything. And I'm sitting over there. I'm like, boy, what's, what's, what's wrong with this guy? And uh, he says to the stewardess, I can't sit here. I can't sit here. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And then I start hearing him say, it's against my religion. I can't sit here between two ladies. I'm like, man, dude, you just got to suck it up. You know, that's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And finally, out of desperation, he's looking around. I'm trying to just kind of keep myself. He looks over at me. And he's like, sir, 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 it's against my religion to sit here. I need you to trade seats with me. Hey, come on now. I want to be, I I think I'm a sympathetic guy, but who's been on an eight-hour flight before? You want to be in the middle? Man, no, I want to be on the aisle, right? So I'm just kind of sitting there, just kind of like, oh, you know. And he he looks at me and he says, sir, I'll give you $50. I'm like, whoa, okay, this is interesting. (laughs) This just got very interesting. It's against his religion to sit between two young ladies, but apparently bribery is just fine. So no problem. So I'm sitting next to my friend who's on the other aisle and he's looking over, he's taking all this in, a good business guy, right? And he leans over to me and he says, Greg, see if you can get a hundred. Like, oh no, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. This guy found his own seat. He moved on. Set of rules. Set of rules. You know, when that Bible is alive and active inside of you, it doesn't want to stay put. It wants to go. It wants to go. Recently, I was in Jordan where we do distributions in the Middle East, and I had the opportunity to stand at one of my favorite places in the world because of the significance of it. There's a concept that so impacted my life, and I wanted to share it with you. It has to do with the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, two bodies of water that share the Jordan River. 
I mean, the Jordan River pours into the Sea of Galilee. It pours into the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is fresh water, number of species of fish, fertile land all around it, a source of life. The Dead Sea, not so much. Lowest place in the earth, eight and a half times the concentration of salt of the ocean, nothing alive. What's the difference? The Sea of Galilee receives from the Jordan River, and then it generously disperses the Jordan River. The Dead Sea looks beautiful on top, doesn't it? Takes and takes and takes and doesn't give anything. And I think there's a visual there for our Christian life. This living, active word of God that's inside of you doesn't want to stay wants to be shared. And I think you and I can live that out and impact this life and even this world in even greater ways. The word of God finally is a seed. It's a seed. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. When Peter wrote this, it's interesting the timing of it. It was during the first persecution of the Christian church. What most people say is, yeah, Nero was probably the emperor there. This dude was hostile towards Christians. He'd set Christians on fire for his own entertainment and have them run around. Nero was a bad dude. And Peter's writing this idea of this seed that's incorruptible. Yeah, in other words... No matter what's going on in this world, you can't touch that. You can't take that seed away from me. And just like a seed, the Bible is full of hidden life. One of my favorite individuals I've met over the years, his name is Deo. Deo Mwamba. Now, there's a lot of reasons why Deo is precious to me. He's one of our national partners who distributes treasures all around the Muslim world. But Dale's story is that he was a former Muslim sheik. Iman, sheik. Went to Medina, had studies. You don't hear about these people converting very often. But someone deposited a seed inside of him. You see, the Quran talks about Jesus actually fairly favorably. It talks about Jesus as a great teacher, Jesus the prophet. Jesus even performed miracles. Where the separation comes in the Quran, and Muslims and Christian is Jesus, the son of God. That's where the divide is at. And so here Deo is, and he's learning about Jesus, do all these wonderful things, and he's drawn to that reality. Jesus, wow. Well, he got, when he got his first assignment in Africa, he befriended a bishop. Now, most bishops aren't in the habit of making a Muslim sheik their best friend. It just Normally, it doesn't end well, okay? So he's got this sheik who kind of keeps coming to him. Tell me about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. And you know what? The bishop said, great wisdom, by the way. It's in the word. It's in the word. So he kept pushing Dale at the word. And Dale was driven to it. And he went into the word. And, and he, he learned more about Jesus. And this living, active book exploded inside of him. And he became a follower of Jesus. Interesting little side note is when he got saved, he, he went to the bishop. He's like, what do I do next? What do I do next? And they said, well, get water baptized. He's like, okay, water baptized. He, well, Deo, as a normal sheik, is not uncommon. He had multiple wives. So he has two wives. So like, How am I going to deal with that? It's like, so the morning of him getting baptized, he goes to the first wife, who was also the daughter of a, a sheik, and she says, or he says to her, I, be, I become a follower of Jesus. Well, she spits in his face, that's blasphemy, and off she goes and takes you know, the children that she had with him. And he, he's like, oh man, that didn't go very well. So he goes to the second wife and he says, I become a follower of Jesus, today I'm getting water baptized. And she looks at him and she says, praise the Lord, I've been praying for you. <laughs> he thought he converted her, but he didn't do very good. He didn't do very good. Well, today that seed that's exploded inside of Deo has caused him to have compassion on the least of these. And a guy who's brilliant among Muslims is also drawn, that last photo was a pygmy guy. 
The pygmies are the last remaining unreached people groups. I mean, if you want to go to the, one of the hardest places in the world, and I can attest to that because the last time I was in the pygmy area, I got malaria, okay? It is a tough place to go. But they've never heard of Jesus. And Dale is drawn, and he's drawn, and he wants to distribute treasures there. Just like, that's one of our distributors. When you guys fill a change your world box, you know what happens to it? That pygmy guy's walking around with that. And do you know what he's done in the last three years? 40 new churches have been established among the pygmies. God's moving. God's working. And we can talk around the nations of the earth, can't we? Jesus' final words, go make disciples of all nations. We talk about the stories of what God's doing around the world. But at the end of the day, it comes back home, doesn't it? It comes back to you and I because the same truth of what the gospel can do around the nations of the earth applies to you and I. It applies to us. And friends, if I have seed in my hand, which is the gospel and the word of God, and I'm sowing it up here on this stage, I probably aren't going to get very good results, am I? So here's my question for you this morning. What's the condition of the soil of your heart? Because that's everything. It can either bounce off or if that seed is readied and it matches soil that's been prepared and nurtured and is hungry, oh my, the transformation that's going to come to my life and your life. God wants his word to transform our lives. Not just the nations of the earth. Shoreline, you can have it both. You can see the pygmies coming to know Jesus and the Somalis in refugee camps, and at the same time, you. And everyone around Monterey Peninsula becomes a target because of the seed that's inside of you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of the gospel that will not return void. Father, we thank you that this incorruptible seed, you have given us the privilege in this one life to take stewardship of that seed. Father, help us to magnify the potential of that for your honor and glory, not only for the sake of the nations of the earth that are being impacted, Father, but for our own lives right here, for today, for tomorrow, for next week, and the lives that we can impact because of what the word has done to us. Bless my friends, encourage them. Lord, they're doing great things. Continue to encourage them in this journey as they're glorifying you. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank Greg for bringing God's word? So I want to give you a challenge and I'll share a couple words before I give you a word of blessing and send you off. Your heart is soil. Keep putting this word into your heart. Read it. If you're not a big reader, listen to it. Just pull up a Bible app and we'll help you. If you need help, go to the Connection. We'll just get a Bible app and start listening to God's word or reading God's word every day. And also, uh, I, this is actually my Change Your World box. I keep this uh, on my desk with this reminder, with this treasure. Every time I fill this up with change, I just turn it in here at the church. I actually don't give them the box. I dump out the change. I keep the box. You know why? Because I'm going to fill it up again and again, and again, and on average, it's a crazy thing, on an average, if you fill this up with random change, it's about enough money to get one treasure and put it out in the field in the hands of some of those people you saw up on the screen. I'm gonna keep doing this as long as you guys keep taking them all over the world, Greg and the team does. I'm gonna keep filling this thing up and turning it in again and again and again because it's changed to me but it's the word of God and life to other people. We have a bunch of these boxes out in the courtyard, and if you want to pick one of these up and put it in your home or do it with your kids and be involved in getting God's word out there to the ends of the earth.